or as good as can be, as they say. Yeah. So just just a disclaimer: we are being recorded. Okay. Obviously, uh, so don't so no po talk about politics. Only talk about wine. I will. I shall. I shall try to leave those aside. Um, Hoyt, can you allow me to record as well? Yeah. I uh, I don't know how to do that. Uh, allow record right there. Okay. There you go. So Steven. Jeremy, uh, the, do you think the correct order to taste the wines is rosé, white, red? I usually go white, rosé, red. White, rosé, red, okay. And um, so I will tell you that I have been a fan of your wines for a long time. Um, I didn't realize that Trien had been in existence for 30 years, but I'm sure I go back 20 years with you. I uh, spent a year in uh, Oklahoma City, uh, uh, well, in the recent past, where uh, the Trien Rosé was our basically our, our rosé and at a very fine French restaurant there. And then uh, a year in Birmingham where Trient Rosé was pretty much the only wine we served, it seemed like sometimes. Um, it, it, there's a big Trient Rosé and uh, Sancerre culture in Birmingham. And we had about 200 wines on our wine list, but we sold probably 80% of our wine sales with those two wines. And then uh, it's been a huge success here now that I'm in uh, uh, Minneapolis. So I really do love your wines and I'm thrilled to have you join us uh, today. Thank you for having me. Uh, what's the weather like in, are you in Burgundy or in uh, the Long Island? Yeah, I'm, in, I'm in Burgundy. Uh, I'm in Burgundy. I was, I was uh, at Trien a couple weeks ago for actually the first time since, um, actually I was coming on three, three or three weeks ago, but it was, it was the first time since before we were locked down. So, um, so it was a good visit. It was an important visit. But, um, but right now I'm in Burgundy, we've got a day of cool weather and a bit of rain, and, and Provence actually is one of the few regions being spared the spared rain today. Um, but we're grateful for a little bit here and they're grateful for dry weather because the beginning of the year this, in, in Provence was, was a wet one, as, as it was for all the south, um, including Italy. And um, the southern half, French, uh, half of France really had a, had a tough fight against downy mildew in the first half of the year. I did... Uh my uh, Zoom tasting two weeks ago was, was Christian Moreau, uh, just north of you. So I'm, I'm, uh, I feel like I'm hobnobbing with Burgundy royalty the, the last few weeks. No such thing. We're, we're not a particularly, uh, we're not a, a region built, built by aristocracy, which I like quite like actually. Yeah, that's, that's very true. But your, your name is somewhat aristocratic in, in the wine world. You're being too kind. <laughs> um, it, you're, it, Diana is your wife? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of uh, Alabama and your wines, I had dinner with her about two years ago at that restaurant, and we drank a bottle of the Snowden Cabernet and a bottle of uh, uh, the, your Malcasor. Okay. Night, yeah. I had not realized that Diana had gone through Alabama. Um, I did a long time ago. Yeah. I'd, um, and yeah, maybe 01, 02, somewhere around there. Well, it was, it was a member of your family. I assume it was her. I can't imagine. I can't think of anybody else it could have been. What's and, it? Yeah, it? It would be her or my parents. My parents went, went for the Magic Moments charity event at some point. I don't know if you were involved with that. Yeah, that might have been it. Um, so what's it like growing up as the son of Jacques Dujac in, or Jacques Sace, well, Jacques Dujac, Jacques Sace in Burgundy? What's that like? Oh, uh, you know, when you don't know an alternative, I'm not sure that um, I'm the best person to, to judge of that. But um, my, I, I went to primary school in my son and it's, it's it, you know, there were, there were eight, eight or nine people in my year. Um, we shared class with other with kids from other kids with other years, and um, at the time we were allowed to go bicycle anywhere we wanted to. It was you know it was, it was uh, I think we were one of the generations that was more outdoors than my kids certainly tend to be uh, because there was less less screen time available, and um, and it was just it was a pretty normal rural childhood. Um, the fact that. 
Is that the thing that was a bit different is that my other, my other friends were not bilingual or, or, or bicultural, but um, so we spent our summer in the US. Um, for a while, I was the only kid in my class who'd been on an airplane, and, and that kind of got me some some uh, some envy from my uh, yeah. from my comrades. But um, but again, I don't think flying is such a glamorous experience that was necessarily worthy of that much envy. But um, but anyway, uh, it's it was that was it was pretty pretty regular childhood. Um, I don't you know. Um, I think in in villages uh, around Burgundy, there's not. Um, I think if you're, I think if you're in town and you were, if you were, in, if I were in Bone and I was the, the kid of a large negociant or something like that, maybe there'd be a bit more of social hierarchy that, that would be felt. But um, in, the, in the little villages, I not particularly that I can tell it. Is your role? How involved are you in Domaine du Jacques? Uh, very. I'm the CEO and uh, I make the wine and. Um, and I make the wine with my brother Alec and my wife Diana, but um, but she's she she has to share harvest between Burgundy and and um, and California, where she makes her own wines, and uh, and there she makes also the wines of another of another winery, um, and so that's that's you know, that keeps her pretty busy. And uh, and during harvest, Alec is usually in the cellars during uh, sorry in the vineyards during picking, and I'm in the winery during picking. My father lends us a hand. We get a we have a of interns who also help us and uh, so yeah, yeah it's pretty it's pretty hands-on uh, the rest of the year there's more I'm, I'm probably more office based and, and more involved with management and uh, I don't I don't prune I don't I'm not the guy who drives the tractor and uh, and we, we know we have we have we have Dujac we have Trian we have um, we have we have a bunch of yeah we have a company we have two companies to manage and, and that, that takes that takes quite a lot of, of time on your website, was the dog got my dog chewing on a bone? I don't know if you hear that in the background, but it's it's quite loud. That noise. We should all be loved as much as my dog loves chowing on a bone. But anyway. I think it's a uh, universal uh, truth that all great wineries have a dog somewhere uh, on their property. Yeah, it's it, it certainly is common. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so, uh, Trian, the, 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 well, I was going to ask one question, um, on the webs on your website, it identifies your father and it says that the, the Trian was founded by Jacques Seyss, comma, um, founder of du Domaine du Jacques, comma, and Aubert de Valaine, period. Why, why does it not say Aubert de Valaine, comma, owner of Domaine de la Romani Conti? Um, you know, Aubert has to report to a lot of family members, and he's he's not the owner of, of, of Domaine de la Romani Conti. Right. He's one right. of the owners and a representative of his family that owns fifty percent. And I think he's very sensitive um, to not attach too many any wagons on the locomotive that is that is Domaine de la Romani Conti, and he doesn't want people to be confused. He's a, he's a signed partner. He's, he's, a, he's a very uh, enthusiastic, supportive partner for us, but nonetheless, he, he doesn't come and blend the wines. He doesn't choose the grape varieties that we've planted there. He does not. He, um, he's left it to our management. And, um, and, he's, and he's very, I think he's very sensitive not to not, not to not to have everything. He'd like uh, there's this one of those occasions where he just wants to be Aubert de Vilain rather than Aubert de Vilain from Domaine Conti, which I think is a, a label that that carries a fair amount of weight with it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, both do, but yes, it certainly does. Um, so your father and Aubert were not rivals in a personal sense. Uh, they no. must have been friends. No, no, very good friends. Yeah, very good friends. And um, so very, why? Very, well. Why, uh, why Languedoc? Uh, uh, Provence, not Languedoc. Oh, no, Provence. Um, Provence. Sorry. Uh, so we're 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 further east and a little and a little further north than the Languedoc. Um, you know, it's it's a region that that has that has felt and still does to some extent um, under uh, underperforming quality wise, but having real potential. So my father at the time was really not looking at rosé wine. But there were a couple leaders for reds that were well, the Bondel, some some wineries in the Bondel area, 
and, and some in the back hills. There was at the time a property called Vignolor, uh, which made some, some still reference Provence Cabernet. And, and, there, and, and mostly there was Trévalon. Um, and since then around the, that zone of Les Beaux de Provence, there's also Ovette that have been, have been making some, some terrific wines. Um, and um, but he was, he was quite familiar with the wines of Trévalon and those were definitely an inspiration. If you look at the style of wines and of, of Provence versus Languedoc and other southern areas, um, Provence is higher altitude as a general area, uh, so there's more acidity in the wines. And also the alcohols don't, don't go crazy. Uh, the alcohols of Provence for reds are 2-3% lower than the, the alcohol levels for Chateauneuf du Pape, which, which is part of Provence or on the edges of. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so, my father liked, liked that style of wine and that build of wine. And, and so that's why he looked there. Also, there was the question of not going somewhere too far. And then Provence is just a straight shot now on, on, a, on, a, summer, on, a, summer, on a summer day uh, during the holidays. It can take you an incredible amount of time to get there if you, if you decide to drive because the traffic gets quite crazy. But the rest of the year, it's a four and a half hour drive. And that's, that's well within range to, to, be, to be present because you can't just leave a winery under management uh, and, and hope for the best. You, you have to be there. And, and so um, <clears throat> different members of the family do spend quite a lot of time going there until, until it, and now it's running. Uh, we've, had, we've had some stability within the team, which has allowed us to, to, uh, to not be there quite as much, but nonetheless, we, we do have to go quite often. Is global climate change impacting those, uh, those considerations, the alcohol level, et cetera? You know, I'm feeling it less in Provence than I'm feeling it in Burgundy for some reason. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure why, um, but it's, it's, it has been odd. It's, there's been, downy mildew never used to be a problem in, in, the, in the south of France. And, uh, and we've just had two really wet spring times that, that were unusual. So I don't know if that's a part of it and if this is going to be part of a greater trend that we're going to see. We've had frost uh, twice as well in the last five, five years, a, a very significant frost. So that's also um, a source of some concern. Um, beyond that, we're not seeing alcohol levels rise overly fast, but we're, what we're seeing is, is very wet, very dry. More sequences like that in Provence, which, which is a bit concerning because that, that can slow down the ripening. You certainly don't want st stress to be, um, uh, to be <laughs> stressed grapes just don't make great wine. You get, you get wines that are overly tannic or, or or green or just unbalanced, and, and we're, we're maybe seeing some of that. But again, I, I feel like we're, we're not seeing it as much. Burgundy, which is more continental, is seeing those extremes of temperature much more. There, there's still some of the Mediterranean influence there that, that buffers some of the weather. Christian said that in 2017, they had to sell off a significant amount of the Le Clos because the, the juice from Le Clos, because the alcohol levels were too high and it would have created a, a style of wine that they're not interested in. Huh. Uh, yeah, it, well, Burgundy, we have, in 2018, 2017 was not a year of extreme alcohols for us at all uh, here, but um, 18, we had two wines that were over 14%, which is highly unusual, and in 19 as well, we had two wines that were over 14%. Uh, but I've, uh, and, and when I say over 14%, one was 14 and the other one was 14.1. I don't think we were high enough actually to avoid the current tariff situation. But um, I don't know, you asked me not to talk about politics, but I do think that that is relevant and, and, and pretty damn tough on our, on our business. Um, and, um, and then the, <clears throat> but, but I've, I have heard of alcohol reports that were absolutely, I mean, absolutely out of the out of norm for Burgundy. I, I there was someone told me they'd made some 15 and a half percent wine. Some people told me that it has 16%. And when you get up there, fermenting dry becomes a real issue. And, and burgundy with sweetness is not great. Burgundy with a lot of alcohol is not great. I, I just don't think that that makes a style of wine which is, which is compelling. But I do, think that, um, I do think that some people are still getting caught out by these early vintages and, and hot vintages. And that quite a lot of that can be mitigated by, by being ready to pick on time. Because uh, the precociousness of 18 was really not a surprise. We knew to expect it. We know to expect it this year, the really early harvest. And yet I still have some colleagues who are taking holidays in the first two or three weeks of August. And they're just like, well, 
you know, maybe that, I know it's a habit and you've got this, I don't know if it's a timeshare or what it is, but uh, just like, why don't you move your, heart, your, your, your holiday dates forward and just be ready for this? And this guy, ah, no, no, it's not really right. No, okay. Um, I think you're probably right. Um, so we should taste the uh, white wine because we're, we're 20 minutes into this and I know people are eager to have a sip of wine. So, so we have the uh, 2018 Saint-Fleur Viognier. Tell us about Viognier in, in uh, Provence and why Viognier in Provence. So, um... So Viognier was not a very planted grape when we uh, when we first put some in, in in Provence, but it was at the beginning of of some increased plantings. Um, Condrieu was was growing, and um, and there were a few other people. My father really liked the Viognier from Calera, uh, from from other places. Wow! And yeah, um, so do I. yeah no, it's fine. Yeah. And, wow. and, and and Viognier was was seen as being you know the the. The next big great white grape hope um, for for new areas, and um, and I don't think that's materialized at all. Um, but we we had we had grafted over a number of, um, of varieties, and it was definitely one of the standouts right from the beginning. We liked it. Um, tang fermented, we went dry. It was not uh, again not crazy alcohol, but uh, but it is the richest of the wines that we make at Trian because you have to wait for those aromatics to, to happen and they, and they tend not to happen at 13%, they happen more around 14%. So that's where that wine usually, usually sits. But you know, a lot of cold is around 15%. So again, I don't think we're a particularly extreme rendition. Um, for a long time, we, we, we fermented purely in tank. Now we do some in, in tank and some in neutral barrels because we feel like the fermentation of different vessel brings something, something different to the, to the blend. And, um, and and we've continued to ferment it completely dry. So it's a it's a different style of Viognier as well because it's grown on clay and limestone. All of Trian is clay and limestone, and most most Viognier, certainly all Viognier in the Rhone Valley, is grown on on acidic soils in uh, on granite in the, in the northern Rhone. So um, so yeah, it's a it's a very different texture. It's not as oily as a lot of Viognier is. It's a little looser knit. It's um, it's, it's a little higher acid than most Viognier is, uh, to be honest. Again, that's, part, that's a factor of the altitude at Trian. So it's, it's, um, it's not as, as, uh, as rich a wine as a lot of Viognier can be. I feel a lot of Viognier is kind of a one glass of wine type of, type of grape variety. And, um, and we've tried to make it you know, at least half a bottle uh, per person uh, type, of, uh, type of rendition of Viognier. So it's, it's a little... Um, it's, yeah, it's 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 uh, it's it's a little crisper, it's a little crunchier, and um, and I think it's and and, and with the absence of oak, um, which which is the a normal thing for Viognier, although there's a few pro popular producers who who definitely uh, favor the the barrel fermentation uh, aspect of things. Where we, I think it's a it's a really versatile with food kind of kind of wine. I went a long time ago at Ospice de Rhone on a. Mark Miller from the Coyote Cafe did a, did a complex foods and Rhone whites seminar, um, where he paired with some um, some Tex-Mex cooking. He paired with some Moroccan food. He paired with some um, Thai-inspired dish. So all things that had that had a lot of spice uh, spice richness to it. And um, and you know, where a lot of whites are kind of grilled white fish is good with this. Uh, I think Vienna is a lot wider in terms of what it can what it can pair with, partly as a result of being unoaked and aromatic. Um, the, as you start learning about wine and you read wine books, um, one of the things that, you're, that you learn about or are told about Viognier is that it's the one white grape that tastes good with artichokes and asparagus. Do you think that's true or is that just a, a you know? Um, I, I, uh, I think no wine truly tastes great with asparagus. The, the classic French pairing is Alsatian Muscat, which, um, which is not a great variety that I'm super enthusiastic about. Um, but, but I think everything on the other hand tastes good with artichokes uh, because I just love artichokes. That's maybe that's, that's, that's my, my sin. But um, no, I think, I think Viognier tastes different with artichoke, but not in a bad way. And I don't know about, I haven't had too many other grape varieties with it, but, um, 
but yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's very forgiving. It still tastes of something. There are some wines that just stop tasting of anything when you have those tough foods. Um, I, I always hope for a Viognier in a in blind tastings because the oh yeah, yeah. give it away. It can't be anything. I mean, it really can't <laughs> be anything else, right? No, when you smell, although, you know, as, as, as things start um, getting riper, there's a, a number of other grape varieties that start smelling more like peaches than, than, uh, than you think when, uh, when, when, they, when they get ripe. There's just that they don't, have the, they don't have the intense floral character that uh, no, classic. Not not. No, that, that is completely true. Yeah. Those, uh, yeah, those uh, linolols, I think those are, those molecules are cool. <laughs> so, 2020 is the 30th year of Domaine Trien, correct? It is. I'm not sure that's what the world will remember 20, 2020 as being, but uh, <laughs> yes, it's our 20th year. Um, uh, 30th year, sorry. Yeah, no, it's, been, it's been a long road, you know, and the thing with, with, with wine, wineries is you, you learn a lot, but you get to show that you learn something once a year. <laughs> it's just not, it's not that often. As a restaurant, you get to show twice a day, potentially, or maybe even three times. Well, and how, how, so how have things evolved in Prov for you in Provence over the time you've well, been? Well, when, when we started, we were making just, my father stopped making rosé or all but stopped. I was just, it was, uh, we moved to mostly white and red. And, um, and then we started making rosé again for real in the late 90s. So a long time in. We were just making, we were making it in, in small volumes and selling almost, entirely in the French market uh, because we just didn't have the volume for it. So everything at the time was estate grown too. Um, but then we decided that we should try exporting the rosé uh, outside of Europe. And, um, and so that we need to buy some grapes and we need to potentially buy some wine for it. And, and uh, so that we could supply it for the whole uh, summer season because it was so seasonal. And since then, rosé has taken off in a, in a big way, not just for us, but for, for the whole category. Um, People are not drinking rosé just in, in summer and just not just on, sun, on sunny days. Now it's become a much more year-round uh, beverage. I think the quality has, has risen immensely for that category because, um, because a lot of research has gone into it. 85% of, of the Provence production is rosé, which is kind of insane. Um, and so, and so the, the, as you can imagine, Provence is very uh, determined to push the quality because it wants to stay at the at the forefront of the, the reason uh, the, the region people think of for rosé. Um, <clears throat> and then at Trian specifically, um, we've reviewed grape varieties as, as we've narrowed down on what we thought worked well for us. Uh, we've replanted some of our vineyards. We we um, we updated the winery significantly a couple years ago. We've uh, we've um, we now have a, an entirely new bottling and labeling facility for and for shipping and so on, which which came with increased volumes, with came, which came with the rosé success. Um, we've invested quite a lot in the, in the people we have down there. So we've had some, we've had the same winemaker since 1997, uh, who's been who's been great, and whom we've made a, a small partner in the in our in our operations, um, and. Um, and we've uh, and we went from twenty uh, for the first twenty years we we didn't make any money. Uh, you know, it's the it's the thing about wineries. It's very it's uh, much easier to lose money than to make any. And and we're not selling the wines for for very much uh, for very much. And so for the first twenty uh, uh, years we were we were just reinvesting as best we could to keep the to keep it and and, and keep believing. But um, but you know, twenty years is a long time. And so we were we were awfully grateful when we started falling even and and um, and then it, it, about 10 years ago it started turning around and we've uh, and we've uh, and we're now a healthy company that's that's doing well although this year is tricky but um but as a whole we're much i think if this if, if a year like this had happened 10 years ago um, we would have we would have been over would have been finished so uh uh the viognier if if you wanted to drink uh, viognier tonight with dinner after we finish um what what kind of food would you prepare to pair well with the, the viognier? One of I, my favorite probably pairing with viognier is crab. I really like it with with crab, and I really like um, well, they're like a crab pasta with butter with uh, with with so, so some you know some shelled crab on with uh, butter and lemon and but maybe a bunch of herbs like uh, like coriander and um, and parsley and <clears throat> chervil. 
or something like that, maybe some chili in there. Uh, that's something I really like. Um, or, but I also like cold shellfish, um, I think is, is pretty great. Um, but I, I, yeah, I really like it with, with shrimp, with crab. Um, I suppose lobster as well. Lobster feels very luxurious um, anywhere outside of Maine. Uh, but um, I was shocked to find out. I went to Maine once and saw lobster rolls being offered at McDonald's, which, which is Good. something that my French mind. But, um, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, so yeah, shellfish is, is, is probably my favorite. And I like, I like it with just a little bit of spice and a little bit of heat. Um, and I think that works particularly well with the onion. But it's also, and, you know, it's just, it's good with all sorts of mixed salads and stuff like that. It's, it's good, it's good summer food. Um, wine. And actually, in some ways, it's not totally different from rosé and the way it pairs. I don't imagine there was much, or if any, lobster in the lobster rolls at McDonald's. I decided not to stop and check. I just, it was, <laughs> it was just, there were, there were other venue calling with, with probably, bet with, with I, I felt my odds were best somewhere else. <laughs> I, I, I would feel strongly about that. So, um, the rosé. Tell me. The rosé. Talk to us about the rosé. It's become our workhorse. It's by a long way the wine we make the most of at this stage. Yeah, 70% of Trien's production, so a bit less than the Provence average, but nonetheless, overwhelmingly, we've become a, a rosé driven estate. Um, I think rosé is best as a wine of not too much, you know, um, although you can drink too much of it. But, um, but it's, it's, it's at its best when it's not too much alcohol, um, acidity, but everything's got to be really in balance because if, if, if there's one dominant feature where it's, oh, wow, this is so uh, high acid or, oh, wow, this is so uh, fruit driven and so on, that you, you, you just end up with a bit monodimensional and, um, and you also end up, uh, that, that feature becomes um, tiring after a while. Uh, and, and really when, you, when, when I look for the best quality of a rosé is that it, it's, it's on the table and one bottle gets finished and you open another one and one bottle, and, you know, it's kind of, it's, it, it's the way I see it is, is still um, a you know, terrace lunch with friends type of thing. And, and you can, the mark of success is how many bottles have been finished by the end of that lunch. And, um, and if you make it a wine that's just too big, too concentrated, too, um, <clears throat> too powerful, all those things, at some point you want to move on. Whereas, whereas there it's, it, <clears throat> it's wine, but it is consumed in a way that's quite different from, uh, from white or red. It's, it's not necessarily th there to be, um, to be a moving emotional experience, but it is, it is there to just be delicious. And, and in that sense, I think that it's good to have, so that's why it's, it's completely dry. We try to keep the alcohol very moderate. Um, so usually in most years, it'd be around 12, 12 and a half percent. In 2019, it's labeled 13%, uh, if I remember correctly. And it was just a bit richer. It's probably 12, eight but in, in France, where uh, for labeling laws, we have to round up, or round up or round down, but we have to be within half a percent. Um, and um, and it, on the other hand, it does have to be very aromatic because because it's sort of chilled um, more often than not. And if you're if you have a wine that's not aromatic, it just doesn't smell of anything when it comes out of that that ice bucket. Um, so that's 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 the that's how I'd like how, that's how I like to uh, our rosé to be. Now, whether we succeed every year, now that's for for our consumers and, and clients to tell us because. Um, because they're they're the ones who are who can tell me how many bottles they've, they've drunk by the end of that lunch, but um, but that's 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 the ambition certainly. Uh, uh, what temperature do you if, when you drink Trian Rosé? What temperature do you drink it? Um, so I, I keep in mind that I mean just again I, I'm still. Some people drink it year round. I'm still very much a drink it in, on, on sunny days kind of guy. And, uh, and so consequently I serve, it, I, I serve it really very cold because I know it's gonna get warm in the glass, um, depending on how long people take to, to drink it. But nonetheless, I start out cold. So I usually put it in an ice bucket and it's ice bucket temperature. So uh, I, I think in Celsius around four degrees Celsius or something like that would be the temperature. That's pretty cold. That's cold. That's yeah. 42 degrees, I think, something, Fahrenheit, I think. Okay. Yeah. By the, by the time it's in the glass and you're using it to refill a glass that might not be completely finished and that sort of thing, it, it gets so it's, it gets consumed around eight, eight between eight and twelve would be I guess the, 
Yeah, I think, you know, one issue with rosé is we think of it as that type wine where, it, you, you know, it's a picnic wine or a mm -hmm. boating wine and you it's shoved down in an ice chest and mm -hmm. you pull it out and pour yourself a glass. And when any wine is that, when any wines are that cold, they tend to taste a whole lot alike. Oh. No, yeah, that's that. That is that is true. That is not the most flattering. That is you know different from the Zalto glass experience that you could have. You know, and uh, and it might be drunk out of a, out of out of, out of a plastic cup um, as well. But um, that's that's definitely not how it's best. But I have to say that where it might be extremely judgmental of the way people consume uh, their uh, aged Burgundy and that sort of thing, when it comes to rosé, I'm much more mercenary and forgiving and, and understanding of how you can drink it however they want. If they want to stick a little umbrella in it, I'm okay with that. Well, you you sell it in kegs, right? Exactly, exactly. So, Which I think uh, is actually, the kegs have been, have been um, I think for wine uh, drunk and consumed young, I think it's a really great way of shipping wine because it's much lighter than uh, cases of wine. Uh, right. There's much, there's no glass involved from an environmental standpoint. And, um, and we do farm the state grapes at Trian are farmed organically. And a lot of the grapes that we put into the rosé are farmed organically, but it, it, not all of them. So we can't, and, and, and it's about 50%. So, um, so we can't label the wine organic or remotely, but, uh, but nonetheless, it, it, the environment is a very big preoccupation. We talked about global warming earlier. We, we want to minimize our impact and, and the glass bottles are unquestionably one of the big uh, the glass bottle takes takes a lot of carbon to, to make it takes a lot of heat and so um, and so the kegs on that front I think are wonderful uh, a wonderful way of shipping wine and um, and I think sorting table are working on a, on a, on a project so that they can offer refillable bottles for people to come in and, and load up and uh, from, yeah. from keg which I think would be terrific. Yeah. Are your I can't remember. Are your kegs plastic or steel? They're 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 plastic because plastic. we we yeah. can't we can't get them back. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah yeah yeah. So uh, oh of course. So they're they're also a lot lighter. So the shipping yeah. Uh, is, yeah, and they're and they're recyclable. So that 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 has value. Um, it would be nice to have um, you know an exchange system like breweries have that that that, that is global rather than just uh, country by country, but. But it's a start. It's for wine by the glass. It really is great because you don't have to worry about how long the bottle's been open. Absolutely, absolutely. No, yeah. they're, they're, the the technology for that is just so much better than bag and box or some of the other uh, alternatives that, that are arrived for for bulk wine. What per, per proportion? What percentage of your production is rosé now? About seventy percent. Yeah, seventy percent. Wow. And what? 10% white and 20% red? Uh, it's, it's, let's see. Um, no, it's maybe, it's maybe between, between the remainder. Um, it's, it's probably, it's, it's, it's not quite an even split, but it's just only marginally more red. It's about, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's within margin of error split between white and red. And uh, again, uh, if you were, having a, a glass of rosé or a bottle, well, in your case, a bottle, of, as you say, a bottle of rosé with dinner tonight. Um, what kind of food is perfect with the Trian, the 2019 Trian rosé? So I was once in the market and I had a, I had my, possibly my best sales call ever, um, which was we were in Seattle and uh, the sales rep I was working with had invited the, her her favorite buyers and a group of buyers for lunch and they all showed up which is which is unusual yeah. um there's well. usually a couple no shows so that in itself was 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 highly unusual it was a bright sunny day and from what i have read and heard about seattle this is also not typical Correct. um and, and so the the, the lunch that we had we had a, a rest we privatized the women restaurant um that was not usually open for lunch but um but we were able to move it outside on the terrace and we had the rosé with Marcona almonds on the terrace. And it was the, it was the easiest sales job I've ever had to do because it was salted Marcona almonds and rosé for some reason worked fantastically together. And I thought that was, so that's not a meal, but that was, as, I, as you can tell, this was, this was a while ago and I still look at that day and say, wow, the, the stars really aligned at that, at that time. And so you serve it, you know, you serve it with sunshine. Um, 
but otherwise, yeah, no, I really like it with with um, with with summer food. So um, you know, uh, raw vegetable salads and um, and and maybe some again seafood. I, I that's just that's just what I like. But um, but you could say you could have a roast chicken salad and that'd be fantastic, and uh, and that would work well. Uh, I'm going to quote you that that statement you just made. It's best served with sunshine. Um, yeah, you can expect to be quoted a lot by me with that. I'll, I'll take uh, you know just one cent. I think every time you say it would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was very very eloquent. I love that. Um, you know, uh, we when I came here a year and a half ago to Minneapolis, which where it's very cold a lot of the year. Um, I came from the southern United States and. My so I bought uh, ten cases each of my ten favorite or fifteen favorite rosés for the summer here, and of course the summer here is about four days long, um, unlike you know the South where it's four months long, and uh, the one rosé that we blew through was yours. I'm glad to hear Rest. that. But I saw Tom shaking his head at the saying it's at least five and a half days. Um, <laughs> I, I I over overestimated the rosé market just a little bit my first year <laughs> in the Twin Cities. Uh, but, have a, but you know, in, in France, the the ski resorts have turned into big uh, big consumers of rosé because there's terraces there, and even though it's cold, people French people are just fine with just yeah, but but it's sunny and that's and we're eating outdoors, so let's have rosé in there, and, and so they they blow through quite a lot of wine at, at that time. And so, the, so the, the blend in the rosé is, is Sanzol, Grenache, Syrah, Morvedra, and Merlot, is that right? So it, it, it changes from year to year because we do bring in fruit and we do, um, and so that, that part is fairly static um, or consistent, but we also buy some wine in bulk and there we're not looking at grape varieties particularly, we're looking at the wines we like best. So it's, it is overwhelmingly Sanzol because it is the, that's the workhorse of Provence Rosé. And it is the, it, it makes wines in the style that we like. It, it's very good at keeping, um, it's, it's, it makes big berries, uh, it was It was originally planted um, so widely because it can be used both as a table grape and as a winemaking grape. And, uh, and so that tells you something. It just if you're going to, if it's a grape for eating, we're not looking at the tiny, thick skinned, tannic berries of Cabernet Sauvignon or, or or some of the other uh, workhorse grape varieties, and um, and so it's it's yeah it's it's, it's thin skinned it's big big berries it's not seedless uh, otherwise it would have remained a, a successful um, table grape it, it is but uh, in the same way with the things you like in table grape are usually for it to be fairly sweet and and um, and a highly uh, fairly acidic and and it, it has uh, some of those qualities and so um, and so it allows you to make a rosé that um, that's I say fairly sweet. That's, um, but not as sweet as thirteen percent sweet. It, it doesn't, and it, it's and it's quite productive. So, so anyway, it makes it makes these rosés that have very pale color, don't have a whole lot of tannin, uh, and have these really nice red fruit uh, aromas. And that's that's the one we that's those are the rosés we like. And so that, so mostly it's that. So, but in the area, there's also quite a lot of those other grape varieties that I mentioned planted. And, and those all are capable of making good rosé. Uh, Syrah gets a little bit dark and tannic potentially, and, and, um, and Merlot can have a bit of those orange hues that, uh, that we don't necessarily, that are not quite as visually appealing, but, but actually flavor-wise it makes really good rosé. Well, that's my next question. Why Merlot? I don't really think of Merlot as being a Provence grape or really- I, I don't know why it's been I'm not sure why it's been planted so widely and what the history is behind that, but there's a lot of it in Provence. Really? And there's, and there's a fair amount of Cabernet Sauvignon. I mean, the fact is, those are, those are two great varieties that had wide international success. And, you, you know, you, it's not hard to, to imagine that before they had international success, they may have had uh, national success. And, uh, you know, you see it in, in, in places you wouldn't expect, like, or you would not have expected um, a while ago with... with um, in, in on the Bulgari coast, but there's a lot of Merlot and Friuli because the Napoleonic oh, sure. troops went through there, and um, and those are proper old vines. So I think I think that post phylloxera there probably was quite a lot of 
of grape varietal exchanges throughout regions because there was a lot of agronomic research around the time and I, and I suspect some stuff got replanted. Some of the Bordeaux varieties have been around Provence for, for a long time. How involved are you in Snowden? Not very. Um, I think, you know, it's, 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 it's really, um, it's, it's really, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Um, and uh, so uh, this is, it's Dinah's father and uncle uh, own it, own it, and, and uh, Dinah's uncle uh, really runs it. And and Dinah is involved as the winemaker. She asked me for feedback with some regularity, but um, I have two wineries to run. I do a bit of consulting as well um, with a few others. So those are my projects, and I and I think that um, Dinah's plenty capable. And if she needs support, I'm happy to provide it. But otherwise, it's it's good for her to. Uh, to have her own thing and not having the trying to emit um, opinions that are not necessarily required or, or desired. So it, it keeps it keeps the peace. Uh, wisdom is an important uh, quality in a marriage. Absolutely. So uh, you you are is your father still actively involved in winemaking and etc. at Domaine du Jacques? Um, you know, he's, he's, he, he lends us a hand. He's there to support us, um, is, is the way he puts it. And he, he definitely is, is active and, and, and helpful. You know, he, he does a lot. He's, he, he's turning 79 next week. And, um, and so as you, as you, as you, as he's well entitled to, he's slowed down some and, uh, and he's perhaps less, uh, I don't let him drive the forklift anymore. I think that's, that's better for everyone. Um, he, he, he keeps the statistics a lot during, during harvest, which I, which I, which I really appreciate. Um, he's available to share experience, um, and with which he, you know, he, he this, uh, this was, it was his 50th harvest, uh, three years ago. So he's, he's got, uh, at Dujac and, and a few others before that. Um, so he's, he's very, uh, willing to, to look back on records and, and share experience. But he also is uh, fully understands that this is it's it's our turn and it's uh, and we're we've got experience of our own um, and um, and so we he's on that front he that he lets us take the lead quite quite comfortably. There's there's been times when I've had I've had some um, we've butted heads a couple of times which have which have turned around the fact that it's all very you know it's it's fine to want to share experience I think that that's that's very welcome. But um, every generation has got to be allowed its mistakes as well. And, um, and I feel like sometimes he's been a bit too keen to say, are you really sure you want to do this? And sometimes it just, in winemaking, no, you're never sure of anything. I, I, the picking date is, is, a, is a, a loose concept. We try to feel our way towards a good picking date and to get it right. We try to, we get, we try to get it right, of course. Um, but... I think fine wine take, has an element of risk taking in it. And so you're never sure. You're like 60, 40 sure, or maybe 55, 45 sure, but you're not, you're not 100% sure about much. And so um, that's, that's one of the things that we've, we've sometimes clashed a little bit. With. We had, uh, I had a, an event with Angela Gaia, uh, I think 15 years ago. And then about a year ago, I had a similar event with his son, Giovanni. And they both told the same story, which was that when uh, Angelo first took over from, from his father, um, he, there were things he wanted to do that his father would not have approved of. And one of them was green harvest. And according to the story, uh, Angelo and his wife would go out in the middle of the night with flashlights and, and do the green harvest because Angelo's father considered it a sacrilege because the grapes were a gift from God and to cut them, cut the branches off or the shoots off and drop them on the ground was actually a sin. Do you, is there anything like that in, in, in your mind for Domaine du Jacques that your father would be that opposed to? Um, uh, well, uh, I suppose in, I wanted to do late malolactics, and so I wanted to cool down the cellar to inhibit the malolactic. This was after in 2000, we had wine in two different cellars, and one went through early, and the other one went through late malolactic, and, I, and we actually all preferred the, the late malolactic. But, um, but I got it pretty cold in the cellar by opening air vents and, and, um, 
and doors, etc. As the weather was cooling, and and uh, and that really did that worked. But every day I'd go and open the the vents and the doors, etc. And and I'd come back, and they'd all be closed again. And and uh, and then I'd open them again, and I'd come back a little later, and they'd be closed again. And, and after a while, I figured out who was doing this. <laughs> um, but uh, but anyway, we 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 that that that, did, that lasted one year. The results yeah. were good. So we we're fine. So, so yeah, yeah, you proved it. You you proved your theory right. Correct. Well, exactly. Yeah, at some point. But the problem is, it's, it's, that's that's a, that's a, that's one of those uh, things where doing a small trial is really hard. It's it's uh, because once your cellar starts going, all the barrels go. go. So you can't. It was it was serendipitous that there was one year where the wines were in two cellars, but that was not. Um, it was not the ambition to keep it that, and and the cellar which was cold, which was coldest, was also warmest in summer. So that had its its back back uh, backdrop. So um, drawback. Sorry. Um, what does what's the average retail price of your most expensive wine at Domaine du Jacques? I do not know. Um, we have it, to ask, maybe ask Steve, but um, it's well under a thousand dollars, right? It would be Bon Mar, and I don't know how much it retails for. The the thing is, there's always, yeah, there's people who go with, there's uh, retailers who go with the normal retail margin, and there's people who price to market, or what they think market could be. <laughs> well, and, my real question is, why your your partner, Monsieur de Villain, is his best, his two most expensive wines, well, they won't even allow you to list them online, because they don't want people, you know, conjecturing in them, but um, they're $6,000 a bottle or $7,000 a bottle for the Montrachet and the uh, Romanian Clinty. Uh, Domaine Loire's most expensive wine is, you know, the Musigny or the Richefort at three or $4,000 a bottle. Why, why are your wines so much less expensive when they're easily the equal? Well, I don't think they're easily the equal, but, um... Especially, well, I don't. I, I, like, let me let me. Re I don't mean that it's easy to make wines. I, I don't mean that it's easy. No, 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 no. Sorry, no. I meant. I, I meant. I, I understood. I think you meant they were they were comparable in quality. Um, and and honestly, I we went to the t in 2013. We went to taste the the 13s out of barrel at the Domaine de Romagne Conti, and we know we make a tiny bit of Romagne Saint Vivant, a little bit of Chambertin, and those are our top wines, and. Um, and, but we don't we don't put them to market anymore. But the, the owners of the vineyards do uh, sell some, and um, we we decide to accumulate them with in the hope of one day purchasing the vineyard and being able to bank our back stock. That was the idea, and not that that's going to work out necessarily. Um, but um, <clears throat> but anyway, the and those and those vineyards do and those wines are in such minute quantities that the market does price them and value them very high. Um, but for the but for the the, the Clos Saint-Denis, Clos La Roche, and Bon Mar, we, we have a much more um, traditional approach to, to, to the market where we just, you know, we sell them to the importer, who sells them to the distributor, who sells them to a retailer, who sells them. On the secondary market, they get expensive. On the primary market, I, anyone would argue that, uh, you know, more than three figures for, or three figures plus, uh, or high three figures for a bottle of wine is outlandishly expensive already. Whether you can compare them to the Domaine de Romain Conti, when we went to that, 13, uh, that 2013 tasting, we came back very humbled. They they knocked it out of the park on those on those on those wines, and they're and they're great. But everyone has um, has favorite styles, and um, and the and the and the the, the market is <clears throat> it's you know it's a capitalistic system, so it's supply and demand, and 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 so then it's about quality, but it's also about perceived quality. It's about number of people fighting for those same bottles of wine. And then as the people who've had the access to those wines, because for Burgundy access is, is, is a big deal of having an annual allocation with a retailer or something like that. Um, and the people who have that access, whether they decide to hold on to their wines or to, or to flip them. And ideally they're, they're, they're holding on to them, but perhaps, uh, perhaps a large number of our customers, and I hope, you know, see that the wines are just, well, I get so much bang for my buck on these wines that I don't want to, to flip them and create a secondary market that's too important. Although the secondary market does exist, they, they do crop up at auction regularly, but I think the volumes are not as big as on, on, on some, of the, some of the more um, high-powered names uh, that are the BDRC or Le Roi. Um, 
Um, but I, I'm not I'm not entirely sure. And then there's also how much there's a there's a kind of a reverse psychology that happens with some of the pricing, which is the higher you price out of the uh, out of the property, and, and I'd say that some of my colleagues do that. The more people say, well, then it must be worth that much because they you know, they seem to be selling it that much, and so they must be better. Um, which has not necessarily been our attitude. We try to keep it fair. Do you have any interest in biodynamics? Yeah, no, we're doing, we, we've been farming biodynamically, well, part of the domain since 01 and 100% of the domain since 08. And how has that changed the ones? It's, you know, it's very hard to quantify when, it, when you're talking about biodynamics, um, but we have seen an impact on the soils. We have seen uh, an impact on the way the canopy carries itself. Um, we, we've been conducting for the past five years a, a small trial, one that is just organic, and the one which is organic plus the biodynamic preparations. And uh, in the kind of the organization of the canopy and in the structure of the soils, we see some differences. It is, um, it's been hard, the, the, the vineyards yields have been inconsistent, where they've been out of sync. One's been making high yields one year, and the other one the other, and so they're, <laughs> They're not directly comparable in the wine making, on the winemaking front. Um, but when we've taken colleagues to the vineyard and not told them which was which and asked them which one they preferred, it was, it was subtle in their preference. There was no, oh, this, this one definitely, but when pushed, 100% of our colleagues chose the biodynamic one. Um, as if you had to, if you had one that you liked a bit better, say, oh, maybe this one. It's, and it was always the biodynamic one. So it's, it's hard to, it's hard to really, um, Pinpoint. With the organic, it was very straightforward. Uh, I could, I, I know you can go into that afterwards if you want, but um, there was there was a, a leap in quality that was very perceptible with organic. There, there was not as obvious a leap in quality while well, we were doing orga organic and biodynamic right from the start on all of them, so I would not have seen it. But when we've looked at organic versus biodynamic, it's, it, it falls into very subtle things. And, and it's, and you know, very subtle things are, are subtle because your sense of perception is only so finely tuned. Uh, you know, it's, that's, that's your qualities of observation are only so finely tuned. Uh, I had a, a horizontal tasting with uh, Anne Claude Laflave from Domaine Laflave mm -hmm. of her O2s a few years ago, and of all her wines from the Malcolm Verze up to the Marche. And um, the, uh, she, she, two things, she commented that the one, result of uh, her biodynamic farming was that her workers seem happier since she converted to bio biodynamics, which is not something she expected or could explain. But she used to hear them grumbling, and now she hears them singing. Um, but the other thing is that, that night, the best wine by far, I mean, pr pretty much 100% of the people at the tasting thought the Creole Batar Marche was the best wine of the night, which is not the wine you would expect to be the best wine of the night. And uh, I asked her about that and she said, well, it's, a, you know, it's, it's all about the lunar calendar. And I don't remember which day it was, the leaf day or for what it was, but she said on, on this day, it, the Creole always so, shows the best. Huh. Um, and could, I, and could was, uh, she was, she was, she was, uh, she was definitely full, fully on board with, with the uh, organic and biodynamic. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a more circumspect in terms of my, of my embrace of it, but, um, but I, definitely, I, I definitely like the results. And I, who am I to argue against the results? I'm not going to say, no, because it can't work. I don't, <laughs> I, I'm not going to appreciate these results. No, the results seem to be there. Um, I think the grapes we're getting are really high quality. Um, and it's, it's not a perfect system. And maybe I'm not saying that we'll never change again, but, um, but it's definitely a much better system than than the previous farming that we were doing, and, and I, I like it. And vineyard and and the, and the health of vineyard workers is absolutely key, um, and uh, to to the whole thing. We're we're very. Um, if people are worried about residues in, in in finished wine, imagine what the people working in the vineyards are would be exposed to if there's if there's any toxic residues there. They're in there most days of the year, and and so using um, low impact. Uh, molecules or certainly things that don't that are not don't mess with your uh, endocrine uh, endo, endocrinal sorry system endocrine uh, your hormone system and um, 
I'm mostly bilingual, but not completely in some places. Uh, um, endo endo endocrine system is the phrase you're looking uh, for. Thank you, endocrine you're system. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, not, not dealing with weed killers, uh, reintroducing some biodiversity and that sort of thing. Uh, simple molecules like sulfur, yes, copper is getting very bad rep, but honestly, we're not seeing any copper accumulation in our, in our vineyards, and it's certainly not toxic to the people working there. Um, I think are, are, are much preferable to the systems we were working with before. What about the, let's talk about the red. Sure, so which vintage are you on? Uh, it's the 2016. Okay. Um, so I'm not great at remembering blends, but uh, but the but Santo Gust is uh, is a is a selection of our favorite batches, and we try to make our 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 best blend of red. And usually the percentages rotate around, and that would be the case for the 16. Um, a little over half is is Syrah, and so maybe say 50 52 percent somewhere around there, between 50 and 55 percent. Then, uh, then, then it's Cabernet Sauvignon and 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 a small percentage of Merlot, usually five percent or under of Merlot. I don't think we put percentages on the back label. Um, we got away with, once with a label approval, and that way we don't have to reprint our label every year. <laughs> I was I was actually looking to see what the alcohol content was. Uh, usually, it's around thirteen five, and sixteen yeah. would be would be there. I it, I uh, I've been lucky to have tasted a lot of legendary wines in my life and because of wealthy people with wealthy uh, generous people with large wine cellars awesome. and um uh you know just thinking back i think all of the greatest wines i've ever tasted in my life were uh, 13 and a half percent alcohol so it's just a sweet spot maybe it's just a sweet spot for me but um it, or with it, the wine regions you enjoy but um yeah i'd, I'd say I'd say a lot of the ones that I've enjoyed have been around the 13, 13 and a half mark. Um, I, I'm certainly sensitive to high alcohol. It's, so Trian is about 400 meters in altitude, so about 1,200 feet. And, um, and so, yeah, we have, we have a long season. We're in a wind corridor with the Mistral blowing through a lot of the year. Um, we, pick, we pick quite late. The Cabernet usually comes when we first started, came in end of October. Now it comes more around the middle first sometime during the first half of October. So it's not, it's not a short growing season. It's quite long. And, um, and the Syrah comes in a couple of weeks before that. So we blend after, um, we blend after at the end of winemaking, uh, not at the end of winemaking, I should say at the end of the Elvage. And then we, we, we barrel, so we select some barrels, we select some lots and we make, we make our, we make our blend and we want, we want you to, the, the, the drinker to feel some of the sunshine of Provence. So it's gotta be, so sh show some ripe fruit, but, um, but Trin is good at making wines that have some structure and have some restraint. It's not, it's not the, the incredibly generous uh, experience you can get from some Southern French wines that are more Grenache based that can be really rich. This is still two grape varieties that, that keep it reined in quite significantly. And the Syrah doesn't get quite as peppery in, um, in the south of France as, as, it does for, um, as it does for some other regions. But, uh, but nonetheless, it has, it has that ripe fruit and, 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 uh, and slight peppery character, which I, which I really enjoy. Um, <clears throat> but it is, it is also high acid red wine, which brings out the tannin for that matter. Yeah. So in that sense, I feel like, and this is true of a number of Provence reds, not so much Mondel, but the, the, the back hills of Provence reds. I feel like in many ways they compare to a lot of Italian reds. Uh, and Provence was, the Roman Italian province for a long time. And, and I feel like culturally in the food, you feel it, that very olive oil based uh, cooking, bell peppers, uh, bell peppers, uh, eggplants, um, zucchini, et cetera, kind of staples. And, and, uh, and you feel that common culture uh, food wise with, with Italy chickpeas and other, you know, it's Mediterranean. And, um, <clears throat> and, and, with, and with that in mind, I think that those are wines that pair well with those things. So you've asked me with other two wines what I would pair, pair it with. My favorite Santo Gus thing is, is a leg of lamb and a ratatouille. And I think that that wine just works great with that. Um, and, I'm, and I happen to make a good version of it. So that's, that's, that's been something I've, I've, I've tried more than once. Um, it's, uh, it's youthful, huh? The 16. Yeah, yeah, no, no, the, and the wines can age. We uh, we have some. We still have some 
we kept back some bottles uh, from folks. We've got every vintage since 06 in storage to other property, uh, um, not in huge volumes, but um, but just for for interest and for a few local restaurants and stuff. And the wine does does well with age. 07 is still delicious. The, well, this this is really really delicious. I, I'm not. I don't generally drink wine at 10 o'clock in the morning, but uh, <laughs> for this purpose, uh, I, 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 drank, I drank wine at 10 o'clock in the morning with Christian Moreau, and I drank wine at 10 o'clock in the morning with Jean uh, Lorenzo Neri from Casanova di Neri. But other than that, I do try to limit my wine drinking till at least 11.30 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, and there's something, when you drink something at 10, a red wine at 10, and you think this is really delicious, it, 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 it comes with a sense of, did I just say that out loud? Uh, a bit of self-consciousness of, does, is this is time to admit I have a problem? Uh, but no, I don't, think, I don't think you do. I think you're just fine. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Uh, you know, we, uh, we all, we, we've had a succession of really incredible uh, tastings on this Zoom concept. And uh, I think maybe a month ago, we had one with Bartholomew Broadbent. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure you know who his father mm -hmm. was. And so he said that his father always said that 10 o'clock a.m. was the best time. That was when your palate was the best. I, for for Trion, we do all our blending in the morning. And we start, yeah, we start early. Yeah. Um, but we try to get it knocked out by noon because of the afternoon tasting is just never quite as sharp. Um, we're having an event with Alan Meadows in a couple of weeks. Um, he obviously loves your wines. Is there anything you'd like for me to tell him? Thank you for all the good press, maybe. Oh, yeah, for, for sure. Yeah, no, say hi. Um, give our best. I hope we get to see him in, in Burgundy this fall. It's not yeah. a given. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but yeah, no, tell him to, to stay healthy and, and, and yeah, and, and, and we hope to see him soon. So what's the, what do what you, as you take over at, or have taken over at Domaine du Jacques and at Domaine Trien, what's the future? What do you, what's, 10 years down the road, what's 20 years down the road? So Trin, we still have some, um, some updates to make to the winery. I really want to, um, I think our team is, because of the volume and the success of it, has grown very comfortable with rosé. And I feel it can do better with the reds and, and with the whites. And I think that we can, we can fine tune things a little bit better. And, um, and they need to, uh, to understand that the fact that we're doing better doesn't mean that we should keep doing what we're doing. It means that we should keep doing what we're doing and improve whatever we can improve. So I think that that's, uh, that's something that, that is happening, but, uh, but we've, we've got to maintain momentum on that front. With, with Dujac, um, I think, you know, I think, I think uh, global warming is going to present us with plenty of challenges that we're going to have to rise and meet. And, um, and among other things, I, I would like to find a vineyard that I can dedicate to trials um, in, a, in a real small way, but, but trials that take a long time. So I want to experiment with more different rootstocks. I want to, um, that's, that's the main one, but maybe with different trellises and, and, uh, and, look, and start looking at things we can do to adapt our viticulture to, to warmer circumstances. And I said global warming rather than climate change, but we're for us it's materializing in more degree days every year. Um, so that's that's the, that's the reason, and and more extreme weather. So I don't know frost protection. I don't know what what will be available to us, but um, but in, but if we dodge frost, then it becomes potentially really hot summers, and uh, and we have to we have to be ready for that. Do you think there's any potential for Burgundy adopting different grape varieties as Bordeaux has done? I, I don't think that's the first step. I think the first step is, is later ripening uh, uh, rootstocks because you can gain two, three weeks just on the rootstock selection. Really? Right. Um, yeah. So that, that puts us, that, that would allow us to just keep working with the Messal selections we've got and all that sort of thing. After that, we could look at selecting some, um, some different clonal material, and that would probably again gain us some time. And, um, and then we'd look at, at other grape varieties. But I think that, um, I mean, we're, it, it's a tough one to give up Pinot Noir, you know, where that's what we've, we've been built on for 20, well, maybe not 20 centuries, but at least 10. And, uh, and so the idea of just giving that up is, is just, it's hard to, um, I don't know, it's not something I can quite, I, I, my mind is not quite capable of going that far yet. I, I was hoping you'd say no, uh, or assuming you'd say no, it would be. 
unimaginable, I think, to people who love Burgundy. Mm -hmm. So um, I mentioned this to Thomas, who's on the screen with us, and uh, I don't know if he mentioned it with to Steve, but um, I would love for this to be a family thing. Where and so we followed this up with the Snowden uh, Zoom tasting, maybe with your wife, and then uh, uh, a Dujac tasting with you and or your father. Um, of course, that would require that we get probably more Dujac than it's uh, reasonable to expect to get in order to have a tasting. But um, um, it, it, if this hasn't been horribly painful for you, we would certainly love to uh, at least follow it up with the Snowden tasting with, with Diana. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure that that's doable. I will um, I'll ask Diana. We are about to take off on, uh, on, on a couple of days. We're taking off for two weeks of holidays so that, um, that when we get back, uh, that would be completely, completely doable. Um, we can, we can well, it would be some for us, uh, you know, I'm, we can, we could record it anytime, okay. but, um, it would, you know, we'd probably share it with our, our friends and customers at this point sometime in November. Okay. Which would be a good time to have a Cabernet tasting anyway. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, uh, th th this has been really special for me personally, because I love the wines from both of your wineries, well, all three of your wineries so much. Um, thank you. I, I thank you for the time and the interest. Uh, thank you very much, Hoyt. It was a pleasure. And uh, Tom or Steve, do you have anything you want to add or any questions you want to ask? Um, <clears throat> Why is your English so spectacular? <laughs> <laughs> My mom's American. Yeah. Uh, where's she uh, from? Uh, my grandfather was uh, was a career military man, so he moved around a lot, um, and uh, including to Europe at times. But uh, so she, but he retired to California. So I guess she, her, from the age of 12, 12 years on, she was in California and then France. <laughs> was, but yeah, I speak English the whole time, and I get a lot of practice at home with uh, with an American wife as well. So it's just yeah, becoming a family tradition there, maybe or or a big Oedipal complex. I don't know. I'm not uh, delve too deep. No. Jeremy, how many children do you have? Two, two boys, 10 and 12. How old are 10 and 12? Yeah. And do, are they interested in the wine business? Um, yeah, no, I think the, the younger one around the winery, he, he's, um, so the, the, my older one is called Aubert, uh, which is perhaps not a total coincidence. Um, I think he walked, he started to walk through the door a few minutes ago, didn't he? And uh, yeah, he started to work exactly. I, I, I was hoping it was his namesake. <laughs> so, uh, it's, it's, uh, no, you'll see. He'll be popular in his own his own right. Um, but um, but so Bear's in boarding school in England, and um, and so he's been there for the last two years. So during during harvest, Dinah takes off for California sometimes, and Bear's in boarding school, and Blaze, uh, the younger one, is called Blaze, and Blaze is left very much to to his own devices. So he ends up spending quite a lot of time with me in the winery. And I've got to say, he's really handy around a winery. He, he, um, he actually, you know, he, he more than pulls his own weight because his weight is not considerable. But, um, but he's, uh, you, um, you see it in different people. You, some people know how to move around a winery I'm, in, in the same way that some people know how to move around a restaurant or in their, in their jobs, you know, the, the, the kind of wide vision that you get, um, this table needs water, this one's, waving their hand and asking for salt and pepper or whatever it is, there's a bit the same equivalent of, uh, in a winery. It's just where the forklift is going through here, the pallet jack needs to be over there, the, the, the scale is there, and this needs to happen. Someone forgot to turn this tap off and that sort of thing. And, um, and Blaze has got, got some pretty solid, um, I think he knows how to move around a winery, and I, I couldn't be more proud. And Blaise, and Aubert is, is good, but Blaise, Aubert gets distracted more easily and, and rapidly his, his work ethic uh, decreases with the time spent and he starts um, hosing people down with a water hose or something like that because that is infinitely more fun than it is uh, actually making wine. I, I uh, coached baseball for a long time and I always noted there was a big change with boys between between 10 and 12. Yeah oh well bear on that front he, he's he's uh, he started young at the, the, the playing with hoses. <laughs> so I always, the boy thing I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I always like to ask um, 
this question, and I'm not asking you what is the greatest wine you've ever tasted, but what is the what is your most memorable wine memory? I've been I've been I've been, I've been very uh, fortunate in having some really great wines, but. Um, When I was in, uh, okay, one, one of the ones I, I, I remember vividly because it was just so great. Um, we were, so I was part, I went to, I went to, uh, to University of Oxford and I was part of the uh, blind wine tasting team, which had a match every year against Cambridge and, um, and we won. And, and so the first year we, um, we, we, so it was sponsored by Paul Roger. So Paul Roger hosted us in Champagne and we asked the, uh, the master of wine who was escorting us and driving us if, if he would tack on maybe a, an extra extension to the trip and we'd go to Burgundy. So the first year we went to Burgundy, the second year we tacked on a trip to, I think we went to uh, the Loire, and the third year we went to the Rhone. And, um, <clears throat> and when we were in the Loire, um, we spent a day in Vouvray and we got to meet Gaston and had a great tasting with him. But the, uh, and that was that was very cool because we, we'd all heard about him, and he, and he was a diminutive man, but really cool. Um, when we went to the Rhone, we visited Noël Verset. I see it on 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 uh, Steve's shirt right there. So, and that was that was really cool as well. He was just a lovely man. And uh, but we had this tasting at at Faux, the Domaine du Clonodin, and he opened. So this was in like 1997, probably. Um, and he opened 1947 Vouvray to finish the tasting with. And he's one of the most precise tasters and he knows his wines and how to describe them. Most winemakers, I'm terrible at describing our wines, but he's really good at it. It's okay, we started and when we first open it, it always smells a bit of plums and then moves to quince and then there's always some spice that comes out. And he just talked us through this wine's evolution over a course of 10, 15 minutes. And it was at the time by a long way, the oldest wine we've tasted. And it just, it, that, that, was, that was super special. And the caves in Vouvray are just amazing because they're just dug straight into the limestone and they're these, these amazing wine spaces. You know, uh, I asked Christian that question and he said his greatest wine experience was a 1947 Chablis Club open to honor the passing of his father. So it's a great uh, coincidence that it, the same vintage. Yeah, no, there, and, and and, you know, today it's that one, and maybe some other day would be another one because there's been. I'm. I feel very. Um, wine has a way of bringing on good moments between friends, family, and that sort of thing. And in terms of the, the way it can bring people together, or can can a shared good time can be a can be a good experience. And that's what I love so much about this one about this this business. So I, I, there's there's been a lot of those, and there's there will be a lot more. I'm looking forward to. Oh well. This has been a, a, a real pleasure. Uh, I can't, could not appreciate your time more than I do. Uh, thank you, Thomas, and thank you, Steve, for making this happen. It is, it, it's been a very, very special hour and a half, and I can't wait to share it with my friends and customers, I, I think, on September 3rd. Um, your wines speak for themselves, but you've certainly been very eloquent, and I couldn't appreciate that more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wade. Thanks, guys. Have Thank a you. great vacation. Thank you. I'm uh, looking forward to it. Sure. <laughs> All right, guys. Bye.